happy Father's Day. It's good to see so many visitors with us. Your presence is an encouragement. Glad to see Diane with us. Glad to have you back. <clears throat> this morning's lesson is entitled, Sin of the Eyes, taking our text from Colossians 3.5. And as you're going to see, the scripture reading says Matthew 6, 22 to 23. And we're actually going to be starting there. It actually could also serve as our text. So we're going to be starting in Matthew 6, 22 to 23, if you want to go ahead and start turning there. We want to thank Dad for the song selection he led us in singing. We sang Pure in Heart. We just now sang, and the, How Shall the Young Secure Their Hearts? And that the Word of God is the only source that can help us keep our consciences clean. And in a few minutes, we'll be singing Yield Not to Temptation. There's an old adage. It says sex sells. And according to many sources, and it's hard to track down exactly the, these statistics because many different sources uh, report that distributors of pornography don't always record and report what they uh, are putting out there. But according to many sources, the annual worldwide profit for the pornography industry is worth $97 billion. Now as we go through this first part of this lesson, uh, you guys that know me know that I don't like inserting statistics into lessons, or at least not a lot. And this kind of came about reading an article this week that then had me read an article and another article, and then before long I was down this long rabbit trail and said, this is staggering. This is terrible information. And so we're going to be going through it pretty fast. So on the back of your outline, you'll notice there are seven sources that I cite. And as you go through the outline with me, you'll notice that several of those places where I mentioned something, the number in parentheses refers back to those, that source page so you know exactly what we're talking about. The U.S. alone claims 10 to 12 billion of that $97 billion pie annually. Then there's questions that come up. I don't know how many of you get these questions, but I get these questions fairly, not fairly often, I was about to say fairly frequently. Uh, not, not as frequent as it sounds. I get these questions pretty frequently, though. Is it wrong to view pornography? Because it's not the actual act. And then I get these questions. Can a Christian married couple view it together? And depending on who's asking and how it's asked, sometimes it comes across as the together is what makes it right. Sometimes they'll even say, it's not like we're watching it separately or just one or the other, but we watch it together. Is that wrong? So I want you to keep these questions in the back of your mind as we talk about this lesson. Anytime I hear these questions, there's an old song, just as I point out in old adage, there's an old song that comes to my mind, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. And in fact, I almost titled my lesson, Oh, be careful, little eyes, and in parentheses, what you see. There's a reason that we teach that to our kids. We want them to keep that in mind. Be careful what you put through your eyes. In Matthew 6, 22 to 23, I told you we'd be starting here. I want to thank David for the scripture reading. I ask you to read it again with me. Or Scott. Or was it David? I had it right. In Matthew 6, starting verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Just to cite a few statistics, and I want to go through this fast. I don't like dwelling on statistics. Lots of times by the time you quote a statistic, it's changed and is obsolete. It's hard to keep up with them, and that's why I don't like using them. So I want to go through these fast. This is the article, though, the couple articles that had me just staggering in my chair. It says, in the U.S. alone, there are one million divorces a year. Just that alone was enough to, this, to, to ruin my day. And so I have this section titled, Effects of Pornography on Marriages. Because then I found out of that one million divorces a year in our country alone, there are several sources that cite 56% of that, so you could say roughly over 500,000 marriages that ended in divorce, cited pornography as a factor. Not as the sole reason, but that pornography was a factor in 500,000 marriages that ended in our country alone. And this says, this was for 2016. And this has been a trend going on for the last decade. So if that's been going on for the last 10 years, 
Imagine what the statistics for 2017 are going to look like. According to Psychology Today, they say the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers polled 350 divorce attorneys in 2003, where two-thirds of them reported that the internet played a significant role in the divorces, with excessive internet and online porn contributing to more than half of the cases. According to an April 2014 issue of Psychology of Popular Media Culture, researchers, quote, found that porn users are more open to marital infidelity, which is the leading cause of divorce in the United States. There are other statistics that said out of those one million divorces a year, adultery is still the highest percent of the reason given for those. This is telling us that they found that those that watch pornography, either one or the other or both, however it's introduced into the marriage, found that they're more open to marital infidelity. What this is saying is pornography can lead to the physical act of adultery, and it will ruin your marriage. According to Time Magazine and Science Magazine, a study found that, and they were quoting the same study, that's why I put both these sources. Time and Science Magazine found that people who started watching porn were more likely to split with their partners during the course of the survey. For men, the chance of divorce went from 5% to 10%, they say it doubled. For women, that number jumped from 6% to 18%, it tripled. It also stated, men and women who begin to consume pornography partway through their marriages are more likely to get a divorce than their non-porn consuming peers. So should you introduce it to your marriage? One study discovered that porn addiction distorts the brain the same way alcohol and drugs do. And so what they're saying is, this study was saying pornography is addicting. Pornography doesn't just affect men. Those statistics reveal they're affected at a higher rate. According to some divorce statistics, it says, Women struggling with pornography addiction equals 17%. And out of that 17%, it says women, far more than men, are likely to act out their behaviors in real life, such as having multiple partners, casual sex, or affairs. And one of the reasons for this, and that survey goes on to later say, is the emotional aspect. That men engage in these things without an emotional connection, but it's hard for women to separate what they're looking at, what they're seeing from the emotional side, and so they go out in droves trying to satisfy that and get it fulfilled. Yet many of these sources, after saying all these horrible things, would not condemn pornography as being bad or evil. It's just that men and women need to be concerned and be aware if they're going to introduce it into their marriage. What every one of these surveys and all these studies should have said is stay away from it. Don't get into that $97 billion industry. Pornography is addicting. It causes strains on marital life and even leads to adultery. Statistics alone, without even introducing scripture, statistics alone show it's a bad idea to introduce it into any married couple's life, but especially a Christian couple. So for the next few minutes, we're going to talk about what it means for the saints to be dead to sin. Saints are to be dead to sin. And yet some couples ask, is it okay for a married couple to watch pornography? And is it okay for a married couple to watch pornography together? There are some preachers that say, yes. There's some couples that have told me, well, I don't care what you say. Brother so-and-so said it's okay because, and this is the defense, Usually, inevitably, when someone is going to be pro for this, they're going to be saying it's okay. They're going to turn to Hebrews 13.4 as their defense. Hebrews 13.4 says marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. This is usually given as the defense that it is okay. The thought here is that a married couple can do anything together And it's okay and it's covered by Hebrews 13.4 because it says the marriage bed is to be undefiled. That means whatever you do is covered by that phrase. And it's okay. They forget the first part. Marriage is to be held in honor among all. Do those putting out in the pornography industry as they write their filth, do they keep marriage in honor? Do they have that in mind? So what happens that marriage bed that is beheld in honor and undefiled. What happens when animals or extra partners are introduced? 
because people want to play out their fantasies all of a sudden. Would the marriage bed still be held in honor when impurity and immorality is introduced? I like to take people to Matthew 19.9 and talk about the leading cause of this. As they said, that the leading statistic for divorce is adultery. In Matthew 19.9, Jesus said one could remarry if the marriage was broken due to pornea. He says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. That word for that is translated as immorality or fornication in the King James is actually the Greek word pornea. It's from Strong's 4203. That word pornea is of the pornea word group, and it's Strong's 4202. It's from 4203, which is pornuo, that means unlawful lust. And the definition given for pornea, and it is a broad term, but the general definition is harlotry. That is prostitution. It includes adultery and incest. Figuratively, it's used to refer to idolatry, when one is no longer faithful to God and going after false gods. And it's translated as fornication. It would also include bestiality as a form of sexual immorality and impurity, that unlawful lust. According to one source, pornea is a broad term that generally means illicit sexual intercourse. That includes adultery, from the Divorce Dilemma, pages 23 to 24. It's interesting to also note that as you look through the New Testament, adultery and fornication are sometimes separated out in a list of things of, immor of immorality. In fact, adultery is usually translated as moikia, Strong's 3430. It is sometimes separate from fornication, which is pornea. But as pornea can include adultery, sometimes you don't need to separate them out. As Jesus said, unless it's for pornea, if you're married, it's adultery. Here's some places, though, you can see it separated out. Matthew 15, 9, we're going to read this in just a little bit. Mark 7, 21, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, we're going to probably read that in a little bit. And Hebrews 13, 4, as we just read, where it says, For fornicators and adulterers. That's pornea and morkia. Pornea and morkia. They're separated out. In ancient Rome, there was a complex for harlots. And male sl slaves and female slaves would be trained in all manner of art forms. So you could go to this complex, and the complex was called the pornea. I don't to tell you what, how this word was used in secular times. The Romans referred to this complex as the pornea. And you could go there and have all these different wings. You could go there for music and entertainment. You could go there for food. And of course, you could go there for what the name specifically suggests. Prostitution in Rome was legal and state-run. It was mostly made up of female and male slaves, though many people went into that profession for various reasons. There's a reason prostitution is called the oldest profession. So my question, after looking at all of these things, and the things that Jesus says, these acts that would cause a marriage to fall apart, why would any couple, especially a Christian couple, want to introduce such a destructive, evil practice into their lives. Now that brings us to Colossians 3, 5. The text I had in mind as I put this together. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. He says, Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. What he's saying is those who have died in Christ in Colossians 5.24 see that? Colossians 3.3 3, he says for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God so those who have died in Christ need to put to death certain things. New King James uses the word or the phrase put to death Romans 6.11 says be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus so there are certain things that need to be put to death one of those on this first thing in the list is immorality, or New King James translates that as fornication. It is the word pornea, Strong's 4202. If you go back and look in 1 Corinthians 6, 13 to 20, you'll see that this was a sin then, and it's a sin now. It was a problem then, and it's a problem now. More and more studies and surveys show American couples are living together rather than getting married. It seems like every year the statistics show there's less and less married couples. You'd think if you were just looking at that statistic, you'd say, well, what's happening to the American family? It's people playing house. That's what's happening to the American family. They're no longer a family unit. 
It's two people playing house and pretending to be a family. And it's not what God intended. But it's what our culture celebrates and applauds, saying, oh, they're, they're not traditional, they're more modern. It's destructive. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 13 to 20 is the, the broad text frame, text frame there. But I want you to look with me in verses 15 to 16 and verse 18. 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. He's speaking there of the physical nature between a husband and wife when they become one flesh. Now that happens in more than just physical ways with a husband and wife. But he's saying, taking that baseline there and saying, if a, whether it's an unmarried person or a married person, joining themselves to a prostitute, they become one flesh with them. And that's why Jesus said, for the case of Cornea, there's a guilty party and there's an innocent. And one can remarry. And then he says in verse 18, Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Why? The next passage tells us, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. You have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Greg read for us from Ephesians 5 this morning on the Lord's table. Where Jesus is Jesus gave himself for the church. He is the head of the church. The church is to be in subjection to him. And the picture there is of the marriage relationship. Paul draws an analogy there of how do we know how the church and Christ are to operate? By the way the husband and wife operate. And both are to be pure. Both are to be blameless. How can that be if we introduce things into our marriages that will destroy that marriage? When it can destroy our bodies. And make our bodies no longer belong to our spouse. But to someone else. Fornication is sin and doesn't belong in the life. The same. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Very similar to Colossians 3.5. I often tie these two passages together because of the way they're worded. In the Colossians 3.5, the, the phrase there is to put it to death or consider it dead. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 says it should not even be named among Christians, those who call on the name of the Lord. Hebrews 13, 4 says sex is a sacred thing to be enjoyed between a husband and a wife. Is that still the case if you introduce other elements into it that would cause immorality and impurity? No, when it comes to immorality, saints are to put it to death. The second thing we see there in Colossians 3, 5 is about impurity and uncleanness as New King James renders it. This is described as lustful living and sexual perversion. The Greek word there for impurity and rendered uncleanness is akatharsia, Strong's 167. And the Strong's Dictionary says it's impurity, a state of physical or moral filthiness. See, there are those married couples that say, well, see, we're not committing the act. We're just watching it together. We're not committing the act. This word, impurity, means a state of physical or moral filthiness. What are you endorsing with your eyes? especially in relation to sexual sin, this says, and it's often translated as moral uncleanness. As I pointed out earlier, some will defend with Hebrews 13, 4, saying that the marriage bed is to be undefiled, so whatever we put into the marriage bed is going to be fine. Another way that it's, it has been defended is that the word pornography is not found in the New Testament. It's from the pornea word group, but it comes from two different words. It obviously comes from pornea, Strong's 4202, and that means prostitution, including adultery and incest, fornication. But it also comes from the word grapho, which is in the New Testament, Strong's 1125, and grapho means I write or record. It means a description or illustration. Thus, this Greek word, pornographia, means a written description or illustration of prostitutes or prostitution. Now again, I ask you, does that belong in your marriage? Does that belong in your life if you're unmarried? No, it does not belong in the life of a saint. 
it falls under this category of impurity that is moral or physical filthiness. But there are those that say, well, the Greek word pornographia is not found in the New Testament, so it's not specifically condemned. Do we need to go through a long list of things that are not specifically condemned but fall under moral filthiness and try to justify them? What this means about pornography, when you look in secular writings that use this Greek word, and then as it become known in English as pornography, it's always described negatively. And it has no place among Christians. It involves a third party, the voyeur, as it is designed to entice. If you look up in a dictionary, or even look under any website that has a definition of it, one of the first definitions it gives is pornography is to excite and to stimulate arousal. That is the sole purpose of it. Why? Because it means to write or record or illustrate prostitution or prostitutes. In our day and time, it's not just pictures and writing, it's video and a whole lot of other things. The sexual act itself is not pornography. Pornography is the description of the act of fornication or adultery. That is pornea, which is condemned. Pornography describes in written form or illustration, pictures, video, the act of fornication or adultery in order to entice the voyeur to lust. That is its sole point. That is its sole purpose, is to entice to lust. Married couples that view pornography together are the voyeurs. It is no longer between just the two of them. They can cause one or the other or both to become addicted to impurity and even immorality, which is sinful. Hebrews 13, 4, when sin is introduced, the marriage bed is no longer on. The marriage bed is no longer undefined. The purpose of pornography is to sexually excite or entice, which is to commit the sin of impurity, either by thinking it or by doing it. And it, it gets harder over time. Pornea is all around us. Billboards, the TV commercials, programs, the clothes people wear in town, going shopping, and etc., etc. The list can go on and on and on. We have to sometimes avert our eyes. But if that's what it takes, do it. If it takes you averting your eyes or covering your children's eyes, do it. Because what goes into the eyes will cause us to think about it. And if we think about it, it turns into action. This is what Jesus was saying in Matthew 5, 27-28. In Matthew chapter 5, in his Sermon on the Mount, over in verse 27 through 28, he says, You have heard what it was said, you shall not commit adultery. So here's what he's saying. He's saying you, the, the act itself is condemned. That's no question. He says, You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. See what Jesus is saying? When you look and you lust, you already committed. To think about it is to do it. What goes into the eyes turns to thoughts. Just to give you an example, there's an Old Testament example of this. We can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. And we can read where David, when he should have been at war with his troops, but he stayed home. And from his rooftop one night, he looks down and he sees Bathsheba bathing. Now there's nothing that tells us in that text how she was bathing or where she was at. If she was doing it indecently and out in the open, or if she just, David, had a, a view right into her home. However it was, he didn't avert his eyes. And we all know the rest of the story, don't we? He did not avert his eyes when he should have. He was married. He inquires about her because it says she's beautiful. The interesting thing is that both David and Bathsheba are two characters in the scriptures that are recorded as being handsome for David and beautiful with Bathsheba. And he inquires about her. So already that lust is beginning in his heart. He inquires about her. He finds out she's married to one of his mighty men. His mighty men have been with him since he was on the run from Saul. They were the most loyal of loyal soldiers. And they were out in the field of battle. And he brings her to him and he commits adultery with her. He puts his lust to action. He coveted another man's wife. He committed adultery. And it ultimately led to him committing murder. All because he did not avert his eyes. It's serious. What we look at, what we stare at, what we linger over, it matters.
causes our hearts to lust, to think. In Matthew 15, verse 19, Jesus says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, there's that word, morkeia, or from the morkeia word group, fornications, pornea, thefts, false witness, slanders. He says these are the things which defile the man. And he goes on to address their issue of them eating with unwashed hands. He says this is what is more important. You need to have control and mastery over your heart and what you think about. This is one of those passages where fornication and adultery, or fornication and adultery are separate. What he's saying is committing fornication or adultery is evil. <clears throat> when it comes to impurity or uncleanness, saints are to put it to death. And then as you go through the rest of Colossians 3.5, we're to put it to death along with lust, that is unlawful desires, evil desires, and greed. What we find as we look through the scriptures is being alive in Christ requires saints to put to death sexual immorality and sexual impurity. As we conclude, sexual immorality is a deed of the flesh. It will cause one to not inherit heaven. So many passages deal with this issue. Galatians 5, 19-21. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10. I told you we'd read that a little later on. Look with me in 1 Corinthians 6. For people that I like this passage for people that find themselves addicted to such things. That this passage gives us hope. It tells us in verse 9, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. He uses the porneia word group and moikia. He says, Nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Anything on that list will cause you to not enter into heaven. And then he says in verse 11, For those who say, I just can't help myself. No, there is, a, there is hope for you. He says, such were some of you. What changed? What made them, having been said it was in their past, were some of you. He says, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. It can be overcome. We just have to set our heart and our mind to do it. To avert our eyes. To think on pure things. Romans 6, 1 and 2 says, We're to be dead to sin and to live in it no more. Either participating in the act of fornication or adultery or lusting after an illicit sexual act is sinful for the unmarried and the married and should not be named among saints. Ephesians 5 and verse 3. So I again say what we started out by saying. Oh, be careful, little lies, what you see. The arguments that enticements and lust are not the same as the act, and therefore they're, they're not as sinful, just do not hold up to Scripture and what Jesus had to say on the matter and what the Apostle Paul had to say on the matter, and ultimately that's what the Holy Spirit had to say on the matter. Married couples are told that they are fellow heirs of the grace of life, and husbands are to honor their wives as such in 1 Peter 3, 7. And in fact, if they don't honor their wives as such, there is a way that they can treat their wife that a husband's prayers are hindered. And yet husbands want to ask me, is it okay to introduce pornography to the marriage? As long as they do it together. How can a husband honor his wife by allowing a destructive, addicting, evil practice into the marriage? that can lead to adultery and destroy that marriage. How can it be on earth? How can someone even consider it? But no, we see in Ephesians 5, 3 and Colossians 3, 5, saints are told to put it to death. And that includes all forms of sexual immorality and impurity. And in fact, the seriousness of this is found in Revelation chapter 22, 14 to 15, where it says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons, that's pornea persons, and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. The word for immorality here in Revelation 22, 14 to 15 is the word pornos, Strong's 4205 of the pornea word group that means to sell and it means prostitution. It means one that sells themselves for these acts. Sexual immorality, that is poor me, will keep one out of heaven. And 
know this is an unpleasant thing. It's not one we hear very often. It's not one I preached on very often. My last time was a few years ago. But it's obviously becoming more and more of a problem for the Lord's people. And it is something that we need to address head on. Because we have Christians asking, is it okay for them to watch it together as long as they're married? No. The answer is unequivocally no. It will keep you and your spouse from entering into heaven if it's not repentant. And it can do worse in this life. In this life, it can destroy your marriage and your relationships. For the unmarried, it can ruin your relationships with your future spouse. For your spouse. That covenant made between you and God. That vow that you are to love him. That you are to love him. You can break that and destroy it and dash it to pieces. Don't be guilty of committing the sin of the eyes. And really, that's my phrase for it, but it's more than just the eyes, isn't it? It sinks into your heart, just as it did with David, and it becomes action. Matthew 5, 29 and 18, 9. Jesus used hyper hyperbole here. That is an exaggerated statement where he said, if your eye causes you to sin, cast it out so you don't go to hell whole. Using this exaggerated statement, this hyperbole, Jesus is saying, remove every temptation to evil no matter what the cost is to you. The Hebrew writer says something similar in Hebrews 12.1. He says, lay aside the sin that so easily entangles so you can run the race with endurance. You need to run to win. And then Jesus warns of, the, of hell. It indicates those whose lifestyle is characterized by uncontrolled immorality are not heirs of the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10, as we just read, tells us you will not inherit in Matthew 6, 22-23, this is where we started, and this really is where I would like to end as we close. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. Jesus says here in Matthew 6, 22-23, we need to be careful how we use our eyes. And be careful what we put into our eyes. The eye is the lamp of the body. And he says, if your whole body, if your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. Whatever causes your eyes to sin, this morning I'm encouraging you, I'm imploring with you, put it to death. In Colossians 3 5. If you're not a Christian this morning, you need to be to repent and to be baptized into the kingdom. You can have your sins forgiven, whatever they are. If you have the heart to put it behind you. To be one of those like in Corinth who were some of those. But you can be washed, you can be sanctified, you can be justified this very minute, this very hour. If you are a Christian, no longer living the way that you should. You need to repent and put to death the things of the world. The things that will tear apart your relationship with God. The thing that will destroy your relationship with your spouse or your children or whatever it is. And if we can assist you in anything this morning. Whether it's the water of the baptism or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf. Come forward now, let it be known while we stand and while we sing.